It's 1990 and CBS has a problem. Their summer programming block has a big hole right in the middle of it. Their solution? Take a flyer on a show about a Jewish doctor from New York City being sent to work in a backwater Alaskan town. A stopgap to fill some dead air. But that's not what happened. What came out during that short summer season was different. It was something important. Something special. Northern Exposure is one of the greatest shows of all time, and you've probably never heard of it. Over its six-season, 110-episode run, it racked up 37 Emmy nominations, winning seven, won two Peabody's, and was consistently one of the most watched TV shows at the time. This is a level of attention and acclaim that the top shows of all time wish they could have. And if you ask someone over the age of 40 about Northern Exposure, they'll probably go, that show? Yeah, I used to love watching that. Whatever happened to it? What happened to it? Why haven't you heard of it? How did a show this beloved slip away into total obscurity? The simple answer is a strange one. Music. One of the core aspects of the show is the town's radio station, K-Bear, whose host splits his time waxing philosophic and playing music. In every episode, in almost every scene, you can hear the radio being played in the background. By the end of the show's run, they piled up over 300 plus different songs and music used. Real music, sung and performed by real artists. Artists that are legally required to be paid whenever you broadcast their song. This wasn't a huge issue back in the day when the broadcasting company would have a store of songs that you could pull from, and for any other song that they would need, you would pay the smallest fee. It also wasn't that big of a deal when they would go and release the show on DVD. That's what royalties were for. Every time you sold a DVD, 0.00001 cent would go to the artist whose song you used. And the other songs that you couldn't reach an agreement with, you would just replace with a different song that didn't cost you anything. Simple, easy breezy capitalism. Well, it was. But the old gods are dead, and the new ones are colder and play by a much stricter set of commandments. No one watches DVDs anymore. Even if you do, shush. It's all about streaming right now. Streaming this and streaming that. And this. This is what's truly keeping one of the greatest shows ever lost to obscurity. You see, you can't pay a royalty on a stream. Which means every single one of those 300 plus songs has to be paid for up front at a price negotiated by both parties. That's hundreds of business meetings Netflix or Peacock or Max do not want to have. So they just won't. They'll let this all-time great fade into the void because it's more convenient to do so. But I can't let that happen without a little fight, can I? Season 1 starts off with a great pilot and ends with one of the best episodes of television ever. It is a perfect foundational season, setting the show's core tone and philosophy right out the gate, no matter how weird this is going to get. And it's gonna get weird. It will always feel natural. The way the show introduces characters and how they interact with the absurd situations that pop up each episode will always feel real. Northern Exposure starts us off with our main guy, Joel Fleischman. He is from New York City, he is Jewish, and most importantly, he is a doctor. The great state of Alaska has graciously paid for Joel's education, and in return, he has to give them four years of medical service. A little note from the editor. 
If it sounds like there's a jump in quality from point A to point B or whatever, it's because I'm re-recording this as I'm going along. So if it sounds better, good. If it sounds bad, just know it gets better. Yeah, Joel might be the doctor version of an indentured servant, but all is not lost. They're setting him up in Anchorage, which, while not New York City, but for a city boy like Joel, it's about 80% of what he's already been living through. They've got plenty of Chinese takeout, and they've even got a Jewish jelly. This is not the worst way for Joel to spend his four years. What was that slide whistle for? We don't need you. What are you talking about? With the rug pulled out from underneath them, our fish is officially out of water and on a bus to the middle of nowhere. Nowhere being Sicily, Alaska. So while our hero sits by the side of the road with only a few suitcases and the golf bag to his name, how about we get acquainted with some of our other characters? We've got Ed Chigliak. Hi, I'm Ed. Resident movie buff. Abandoned as a child. Left for the local tribe to raise. Maurice Minifield, ex-astronaut, current millionaire, owner of most of the town, including the local radio station K-Bear, and by extension, Joel. The pair take a trip into town where they inspect a cozy but run-down office, which is Joel's office. This is where we get our first introduction to Marilyn, Joel's receptionist. Uh, this interaction sends Joel flying out into the street and into the brick. The brick is basically Sicily's only restaurant, bar, and hangout spot, making it one of the primary settings for the show. It's here where we meet Holling Van Cure, owner of the brick. We'll learn this later, but despite Holling being 62 when the show starts, he's expected to live a lot longer, a whole lot longer. This is helpful because his girlfriend, Shelly Tambo, uh, is in her early 20s. Shelly, a former Miss Northwest Passage winner, was brought up here by Maurice to be his wife, but now finds herself happily running the brick with Holly. Let's just get this out of the way. The show knows that Holly and Shelly's relationship is kind of weird. It is not a sign of the times thing where people had a more relaxed stance on age differences in relationships. No, Holly and Shelly are weird, but in a good way. Finally, we meet Maggie O'Connell. Maggie is a bush pilot, a real estate agent, and not a sex worker. She is also Joel's landlord, which will set up constant conflict in the future. Conflict is a key word here. Maggie and Joel serve to be each other's eternal foils. Think Tom and Jerry, but Tom and Jerry were they should just kiss most of the time. So just standard Tom and Jerry. Outside of the giant rats, I actually really love Joel's cabin. I mean, it's right there on the lake surrounded by nothing but luscious green trees. It's a comfort place for me. I'm really going to hammer this point to death over the course of this video, but the way that Northern Exposure handles all of these interactions between the characters and the setting is handled just about as well as you can do it. We always get the right amount of information at the right time. When we learn a character's name, it's when you or I would learn that person's name in that social situation. It's organic. Even Joel, our main character, gets a whole scene setting up his personality before we even learn his name. This is the approach that the show handles every interaction. It trusts its audience to hold on for just a little bit, to give these characters the appropriate amount of time to develop. Episodes and seasons will pass and we'll still be finding out new things about our main cast of characters, which we're not even introduced to all of them in this first episode. They're out there, we see them, but they're living their lives, just as a regular person would in regular America. We, the audience, just have to wait to meet them. This gives the show a very lived-in feeling. Uh, these characters were here before Joel is, before we are, 
when the camera's not on them, they're off doing other things. The last main character we meet in our first episode is Ruth Ann Miller, who runs the local general store. We also get to see a beaver. I know this has been a lot of information thrown at you in a way less interesting way than the show does, uh, and I haven't even covered the plot of this episode, which revolves around Joel reluctantly giving medical care to a whole cast of weirdos, including said beaver. The primary focus being a man who is constantly being attacked by his wife, including once in his office, uh, all because the man is not giving his wife enough attention. This is quite literally the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the type of plots that Northern Exposure will be throwing at you over its six seasons. Joel tries one more attempt to back out of the deal, but after Maurice persuades him with a shotgun, uh, he decides to stick around. We wrap on a fun little town party, and that's it. That's our pilot episode, and we are off to the races. A truly unique aspect of Northern Exposure is its relationship with the Native American culture of Alaska. It has such a love and respect for this culture, and no pun intended, maybe a little one, it really tries its part in exposing it to the world. Ed's uncle has cancer. Uncle Anku, the titular Ed's uncle with cancer, is a shaman who's put up against Western medicine, as Joel struggles to get him to accept the treatment that'll save his life. Through this conflict, we get our first glimpse into this cultural perspective, something that will be a core aspect of many episodes to come. It's always treated as valid, often far more valid than the diluted perspective of their white counterparts. Even Joel, someone who treats Western medicine and science as gospel, treats Uncle Anku's work as a local healer with reverence. He respects the guy he just doesn't want him to die over something as silly as pride. We get our first time with our last main cast member, Chris Stevens, town DJ and ex-con. He's the one to blame for Northern Exposure's streaming banishment. We get introduced to him just before Maurice throws him through a window pane for talking about how gay Walt Whitman was. We follow this episode with a guy named Soapy Sanderson shooting himself and leaving Maggie and Joel a bunch of land, further pushing their schoolyard rivalry when Joel gets an offer to sell the land while Maggie wants to turn it into an animal reserve. After a pregnancy scare, Holling and Shelley have their first two attempts at a wedding, while Joel and Maurice attempt to persuade some Japanese investors into building a golf resort in Sicily. Joel's fiancée, Elaine, comes for a visit during a town-wide outbreak of a Russian flu. Elaine is a delight, and the Ohio, Ohio, Ipsonio mud scenes are fun. This episode ends with a bizarre Twin Peaks reference, which we will be coming back to later. Shelley's husband, Wayne, comes to town in episode 6. Ed has movie hallucinations. And now is a good time to mention Maggie's curse. Every single one of Maggie O'Connell's boyfriends has ended up dead. By the time we get to sweet, sweet Rick, Maggie's current beau, the body count is up to four. She has these super cool death dioramas that she makes with melted crayons. Needless to say, when Rick gets a mole on his chest, he's a little freaked out. He's fine. For now. When writing this, I couldn't remember how to spell Beau. B-E-A-U. And while doing research, I found this article on Yahoo Sports titled 120 Not Cringe Nicknames to Call Your Boyfriend, which has some all-time bangers in it, such as number 19, literally any kind of pie. 33, Big Mac. And for your friend with benefit, my man, and Mick Swagger. The death of Maurice's younger brother causes him to adopt Chris, 
all while Holling, Ed, and Shelly go out to hunt Holling's arch nemesis, Jesse the Bear. Maurice telling Chris, Seed Sprout will stick with me to the day I die. Here we are, the season finale of season one, which is not just the best episode of Northern Exposure, but one of the finest episodes of television ever. There are a lot of things that go into a great episode of television, whether it's a huge action scene, a shocking twist, or a big payoff to years of buildup. Aurora Borealis, a fairy tale for grown-ups, has none of those things. What it has instead is perfect writing and a blazing sun of creative energy. It encapsulates what makes Northern Exposure Northern Exposure. There isn't any fat to this episode. Instead, it's marbled in like an A5 Wagyu steak. It is cozy. It is warm, and yet it plays in the darkness like a dream on a pleasantly humid summer night. As a child, I would fall asleep listening to this episode like it was my wubby. And even now, that opening blast of Moon River fills my body to the brim with comfort. It was this episode that the game changed for me. It is my inspiration to write and to create and why I can't do anything else with my life. It's the reason for this video. So let's talk about it for a bit. Joel and Ed are out for a round of Alaskan golf, one of my favorite type of scenes. When a shank swing sends Joel's ball into a fresh set of tracks. Big tracks, made by big feet. Despite some reservations by Ed, Joel badgers him enough into giving up the town's legend about Adam. Adam, Sisley's answer to Bigfoot, who stalks around the forest and breaks into homes, stealing their Cuisinart and Bibles. This information sits with Joel, the doctor, Mr. Science and Reason, who just can't help himself and let that superstitious side just creep on in. Back in Sicily, a stranger rolls into town on a brand new Harley. The stranger, Bernard, is an accountant who just sold all of his things, bought a motorcycle, and just started driving north. No goal in mind, pulled towards Sicily almost magically, much like Chris was years ago after being released from prison. Chris is powering through his latest art piece, the Aurora Borealis, made of all sorts of metals. The two quickly bond over the piece, and Bernard stays in town to help finish it. Joel's festering only gets accelerated when local town chatter only throws more logs on the paranoia fire that's building inside of him. Thankfully, he's got a house call to attend to. Firewatch tower call? A few hours out from Sicily and Adam. Procedure one more time. When I ask for a patient's chart, I don't want a map to his house. I want his medical records. I am a doctor. It's a fine line, but I think you can see the difference, can't you? Who's next? Ranger Burn. Where is he? He can't leave all of the festering behind. Getting into an uncomfortableness off with a lonely forest ranger. On his way back home, his truck breaks down in the middle of the woods. In the forest, a sleeping Joel is awakened in his truck by someone rooting around in his truck bed. A big, green-jacketed, and barefoot someone. Adam. I'm Adam. Oh, I'm Chef Boyardee. The two venture through the woods into Adam's cabin, where, in classic Joel fashion, Joel can't help but detect the scent of someone else's cooking. Good cooking. Really, really, really good cooking. Chris and Bernard attend a bridge night at Maggie's, and despite Bernard's honest claims that he's never really played the game before, the pair wipes the floor with Holling and Maggie. Joel pesters and Adam angrily spouts off fantastical stories, all while feeding baby Joel. 
Bernard and Chris hit the head at the trailer, leading to one of the first of many, many Northern Exposure dream sequences. Joel wakes up to an empty shack, a thermos of coffee, and a working truck. The art piece is a huge success, even if it took me like 20 rewatches to fully understand that it was the Northern Lights. At the brick, a disheveled Joel, full of giddy, whispers his Adam's secret to Ed, who promptly tells the whole town that their rational doctor had a dinner with the Alaskan Bigfoot. The whole bar teases Joel, who only digs his hole deeper. But Chris and Bernard try to give him a metaphysical defense, but only point the light at their own weird bond. Chris's daddy was away every other one of his birthdays, but so was Bernard's father, leaving both of them feeling half as old as they should be. What was Chris's birthday? July 3rd, 1963, Bernard's, July 3rd, 1960. That's the same picture. A dream of a finish. Bernardo and Chris, linked forever by that good northern exposure magic. And with that short run, we wrap on season one. It was a small taste of things to come. The foundation is set, but I feel like I'm forgetting to circle back on something. Oh yes, it's coming back to me now. Nineteen ninety, May. Turn the dial over. CBS becomes ABC, where a TV show is wrapping up its first season of eight episodes. At its core, it follows an outsider arriving in a town way up north, a town filled with strange and quirky characters, each facing absurd and bizarre situations. A month later, another show about an outsider joining a northern town full of unique characters experiencing weird situations starts its first season, eight episodes long. These two shows will change television history. To say that Twin Peaks was a hit would be a massive understatement. Who Killed Laura Palmer was the phenomenon to start off the 90s. It was everywhere. You couldn't escape it, not even on other TV shows. The Simpsons did multiple bits on it. Kyle MacLachlan hosted SNL. And even Sesame Street got in on the fun. But the show that beat them all to the punch was its fraternal twin, Northern Exposure. Twin Peaks looked at the forest and wondered what lurked in the shadows. Northern Exposure just saw how pretty the trees were. Twin Peaks is surrounded by evil magic. Northern Exposure lives in good magic. Twin Peaks Yin Northern Exposure Yang. Before prestige television was even a thing, these two shows dared to ask the question, what if we made TV shows like we make movies? What followed was two separate bursts of creativity unlike ever seen before on the small screen. And with that much creativity, you always run the risk of burnout. Twin Peaks never got the chance to burn out as it was canceled after its second season later that year. And when it came back 27 years later in 2017, it was given carte blanche to be the abstract masterpiece that David Lynch always wanted to make. And that's the thing. Twin Peaks has transcended its cult status and it is now regarded as one of the greatest television shows of all time. Its place in the world of pop culture has been set in stone. Yet Northern Exposure, whose creativity burned just as bright, but for nearly three times the amount, has been designated for obscurity. In this journey, you will see that there was no burnout when it came time for Northern Exposure to close its doors. And while it's not clear why there was no season seven, there really wasn't much more that they could do. Unabashed creativity at its finest.
Don't get frostbite, Joey. Season 2 begins with Elaine breaking off her engagement with Joel. The way she does so by letter is both so brutal and so human. And Joel has done nothing wrong here, but there's nothing he could do to stop this. Elaine simply found someone else. Someone completely different from Joel and much, much older. But someone else. From a functionality standpoint, it is a necessary maneuver to free Joel up for his half of the will they, won't they of his relationship with Maggie who's still dating our sweet Prince Rick at this time. What about Rick is a running theme for these first two short seasons that'll show up every few episodes. Rick is Maggie's live-in pilot boyfriend, but it doesn't seem like she treats that relationship very seriously. She makes a drunken pass at Joel in season one, and they, Maggie and Joel, get ice horny and share a kiss later in this season. So the question, what about Rick? lingers above all of this, but we'll get back to that later. Creatively, how the show treats Elaine breaking off the engagement, how Joel treats it, really puts the show on a path where it can flex its cinematic muscles. From the scene where Joel reads the letter and it transforms into an old black and white World War II movie, to the movie theater where Joel, on the verge of a nervous breakdown, talks to his ex and then his younger self. This is where the show's love of cinema takes two steps forward. We start to see this creativity more and more throughout this season with increased dream sequences. They have three episodes in a row start with a dream sequence, each fresh and different. They are, in no particular order, a horny Joel and Maggie visit the Garden of Eden. Halling is blasted by a montage of the world. And my favorite, Joel wearing the black fedora. As seen before in Maggie's dioramas, the black fedora is used as a symbol of death in Northern Exposure. She's placed it on all of the little figurines in these reenactments of her ex-boyfriend's deaths. There's Harry, who ate bad potato salad, Bryce, fishing accident, Glenn, took a wrong turn and drove his car into a military test site for missiles, Dave, napped on a glacier and froze to death. That's four when Joel starts wearing the fedora in Maggie's dreams. All of this starts coming about right as he's about to go on a much-needed vacation back to New York City. It's actually pretty cute how seriously the whole town takes these dreams. Like, they're seriously convinced that if Joel gets on a plane to New York City, it's gonna crash and he's gonna die. They even hold a funeral in his honor just to show how much they love him. And as spooked out as that might have made him, it's really his pettiness towards the replacement doctor that they get that ultimately keeps him off that plane. Other highlights of the season include... Holling contemplating adult circumcision. Maurice's Russian nemesis comes to town and the show gets extremely meta during their duel. It is so meta that the characters literally discuss moving to the next scene without the messy shooting business. This is never brought up again in the show's run. This happens time to time because Northern Exposure is so creative that they will throw out a direction or style and then never use it again. In Season 1, Episode 4, they start off with a direct-to-audience Joel narration. They will never have any narration like that ever again. They also use a ton of wipe transitions, like the ones they use in Star Wars, and then never use them again. This shows, from a technical standpoint, that they turn the reins over to different directors and let them have fun with it. Does it always land? No, but it's always interesting, always fresh. Season two introduces two heavyweight supporting characters, one who waits and Officer Barbara Szymanski. One who waits is an old native chief who appears to Ed as his spirit guide in his quest to find his parents. Ed was orphaned as a baby, left to his tribe by a tree or by the river, 
no one seems to know exactly. The first time we see one who waits, they are unsuccessful in finding their parents, mostly. But it's a heartfelt time, and we showcase more of that Inuit culture, something that's really unique to this show. Only native people can see one who waits, and white people, especially Joel, cannot. Also in the same episode, Chris loses his voice because he sees a really attractive woman, and one who waits tells him through Ed that the only way he can get it back is through betting the most beautiful woman in town, which is Maggie, who agrees to these shenanigans, mostly, only to spite Joel which again leads to this big question, what about Rick? Barbara comes in during Cicely's yearly burst of crime, which is the only time that Cicely has any crime of any sort. And it's minor things, usually someone, Chris, stealing just random objects throughout the town in an attempt to remind everyone about the chaos that lives in the real world. But when Maurice's radio gets stolen, that's when he decides to bring in the big guns. And Officer Barbara Szymanski is the big guns. Barbara is great, but she's also the worst. A cop's cop who literally follows the law to its most literal interpretation. No bending, no breaking allowed. She'll serve as Maurice's main love interest throughout the series. You see, the thawing of the ice has a weird effect on the townspeople of Sicily. It leads to Chris's klepto behavior, Joel and Maggie's horniness, and Holling's fight horniness. This leads to Barbara and Holling boxing in the middle of the brick. Holling loses. In that episode, Maggie and Joel make out in the brick's kitchen because the ice melting made them that horny. You know the question, what about Rick? The answer, Rick gets killed by a satellite. My poor, sweet Prince Rick. Our pivotal boy throws his career and his relationship with Maggie into the blender when he has Maggie Proctor his pilot's license renewal exam. And during that exam, Maggie realizes that Rick is colorblind. Maggie, being the loving and caring girlfriend that she is, immediately tells on Rick and gets his license revoked. I'm not saying she's wrong, and Rick is clearly the bad guy here by trying to manipulate her into passing him and by putting everyone into danger by flying impaired. But it is cold-blooded by Maggie. It is so cold-blooded that one wonders how much she really cared about Rick at all. Rick, now having lost both his girlfriend and his career, sulks off into the woods, drinking by the campfire, when something in the sky catches his eye and his whole body. Splat. Man meets metal. Rick and the satellite becomes one. They have to lift the mangled mass out with a truck. And... It's actually kind of funny. Northern Exposure has a morbid sense of humor. There are multiple episodes surrounding a dead body, although most of those bodies aren't as fused as Rick's is. One does get flung from a catapult, though. The town reacts differently to Rick's death. The focus becomes less on the dead man and more on the woman he was dating, the woman with the curse. Soon, men and women, offering their men, are coming to Maggie in search of a relationship, even if it might mean their death. Maggie doesn't take this great, going on one of her many benders and spouting off one of her many I hate men monologues to poor Ed. Removing Rick effectively frees up Maggie for her half of the will they won't they equation with Joel and the two share a dance in a very cute scene that closes out the season. Wait, who are those two dancing alongside them? Why, that's Ron and Eric, one of the first openly gay couples ever on TV. 
We don't see many MLM couples on current TV, so to see one so early in the 90s is more than an anomaly. It's true progression. Ron and Eric are people, flaws and all, but in Sicily, they are amongst a town full of characters just like them. The show accepts them. The town accepts them. Maurice, eh. Maurice is a bigot and a racist. But the show knows that he's a bigot and a racist and goes out of its way to show that those beliefs are very wrong. He does, however, possess some gay stereotypes that are so old you've probably never heard of them, such as liking show tunes and cooking. His house is so insanely decorated. On one hand, you have 18th century antiques and on the other, you have the wall of knives. The realization that Maurice shares some of these common interests amongst two gay men, one who's also served in the Marines, is a source of great conflict within him. He takes great pride in being a chauvinist. But above all else, Maurice is a greedy, greasy capitalist whose worst qualities can be bought out for the right price, which Ron and Eric are willing to pay. $60,000 is enough to buy out his homophobia. This all leads back to that really cute scene at the bar where all the couples are dancing, putting a nice bow on the shortest part of this journey. So with two seasons under our belt, where does that leave us? Where do we stand? We've been introduced to a lot of new characters and expanded on the ones we already knew. Who is our rock? Let's talk about Joel. Joel Fleischman is having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad time. No matter how good Sicily and the people who live in it may be, Joel is trapped. Legally, physically, mentally, Joel is locked into a place that he does not want to be. He is completely out of his element. He lacks all sorts of resources, and his fiance left him for a man three times her age. Joel's simply not feeling it. An air of dread hangs around Joel like a permanent gray cloud. He is the personification of melancholy. And yet, and yet, Joel has something about him that is immensely lovable. He is petty and neurotic, full of insecurities and equally full of sass and vinegar. A big old man-child. But I just want to pinch his cheeks so bad every time I see him on the screen. There is no social situation that Joel can't find something to let fester and fret over. It is impossible. He cannot help himself. But it's what makes him the best. He's like a tiny, anxious dog who's a jerk to all the other dogs at the park who just desperately want to play with him. The town folks of Sicily want Joel to be their friend. Most will view him as one of their dear friends. But Joel can't bring himself to do the same for a long, long time. Because he is a prisoner in a place filled with endless possibilities. Yet, despite all of these flaws that should just grate on your nerves as an audience member, Joel brings it all around because inside of him, there is good. There is a charm. Just as he cannot fester, Joel can't not be a doctor. And Joel Fleischman is a damn good doctor. He guides the town through sickness and health, through birth and through death. He might be there begrudgingly, but Sicily is his town and he is their doctor. Well, until he goes on strike for an episode. But that comes later. <laughs> 